Good morning. Welcome to worship. No matter who you are or where life's journey has taken you, we are glad you have chosen to join us on this Worldwide Communion Sunday. My name is Jackie Lavelle. I'm your worship leader today. Joining me in leadership this morning are Reverend Deborah Schneider and Reverend Dr. Robin Wardlaw. Sean Bala is hosting our Zoom chats. Doug Mark is recording the service. The format today is different, so follow along. We look forward to the message Robin and Deborah will bring to us. As we worship today, we remember and declare God's unconditional love for all people and honor the wonderful diversity of human expression. As we gather today, we celebrate both Worldwide Communion and Orange Shirt Day, now known as National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Our congregation gathers on the traditional territories of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit. We honor the original nations of this land. We also honor Inuit and Metis people, their languages, customs, and culture. May our dance, like theirs, keep us connected to the heartbeat of God. We remember God's unconditional love for all people and honor the wonderful, wonderful diversity of human expression. We gather holding both joy and sorrow in our hearts as we continue to seek ways to stand in solidarity with all people and indeed all of creation as new frontiers of understanding, affirmation, liberation, and inclusion are advanced. We remember God's unconditional love for all people and honor, honor the wonderful diversity of human expression. In preparation for today's celebration of worldwide communion, if you haven't already done so, I invite you to take a moment to find some form of bread and drink with which to participate. Give you a minute. Now, we take a moment to remember the indigenous children who attended the Canadian residential schools and the painful legacy of the colonial system for both indigenous peoples and the settler peoples of this land. Let us offer this prayer together. A prayer for Orange Shirt Day. I invite you to join me as we pray together. It's a prayer inspired by honoring Scott's Orange Shirt Day blog. Today, we wear orange to remember and honor all the indigenous children who went to residential schools. Today, we wear orange and we pray for residential and intergenerational survivors still struggling to be whole. Today, we wear orange and we are thankful for those who speak the truth and shine a light on injustice. Today we wear orange in the name of compassion and the spirit of truth and reconciliation. Help us God to walk in this spirit and seek right relations every day. Amen. <laughs> Come all you people, come and praise your maker. Come all you people, come and praise your maker. Come all you people, come and praise your maker. Come now and worship the Lord. Come all you people, come and praise your maker. Come all you people, come and praise your maker. Come all you people, come and praise your maker. Come now and worship the Lord. This is a brief passage from a book called One Drum by Canadian author Richard Wagamese. 
he has passed away too early, very sadly. He was an Ojibwe spiritual teacher and writer. He's helping us be in touch here with what is it that heals and draws us together. Medicine burns when touched by fire. The smoke curls and spirals upward, plumes of it rising, swirling, pushing themselves in ribbons higher and higher until the smell of it becomes the ancient aroma of blessing, teaching, and communion. Within its fragrant cloud, you can feel peace descend upon you. There is spirit here. You can feel it if you allow it. And that is the heart of the teaching, the allowing. If you close your eyes and breathe, drawing both air and blessing inside you, and then exhaling, long and slow and languidly, you can come to know that harmony is a living thing, if you allow it. In a similar way, as we begin our worship, we light a candle. We too breathe deeply, drawing both air and blessing inside, and exhale long and slow and languidly. I invite you to take a moment and take that deep, slow breath and release it, drawing in blessing and spirit and peace. We speak words of peace to one another. We remember the peace of Christ that Jesus has promised the peace that passes all understanding. This morning, uh, Robin and I will share a a piece um, that we use at East End United. It's using some signing. So peace is we turn from this way to this way and then we move our hands downward. And then of Christ, we make like a banner going from our shoulder to our hip. So of Christ, be with you. And then Robin's gonna lead you with this, which means same, same, and also with you. Okay, so here we go. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. And also with you. Same, same. Now listen to the prayer of illumination. Draw us round your living word, binding us to one another as disciples of Christ and When our time of worship has ended, send us out into your beloved world, strengthened and enabled by your spirit to love and serve others in your name. Amen. The Old Testament reading comes from Isaiah chapter 5, reading verses 1 to 7. Let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes but it yielded wild grapes. And now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. 
What more was there for me? What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that there rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. Here ends the reading. And our gospel reading, as you see, is from Luke in chapter 22. Luke's description of how communion came to be. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it again before until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink it again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Here ends our reading from God's Holy Word. Our next reading is a second reading from um, One Drum by Richard Wagamese. And he's writing here on an indigenous perspective on communion. He writes, when my people speak of communion, they do not refer to religious ceremony. Instead, they refer to an act of aligning personal energy with earth energy universal energy, and ultimately eternal energy. All of our rituals, from prayer to smudging, to the pipe ceremony, to the sun dance and the sweat lodge, are about the act of aligning energy, of allowing our spirit to enter the flow of the great circle of spiritual energy that is everywhere around us always. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks Thanks be to God. So I've been very fortunate in my life and ministry to have participated in several First Nations rituals, the ones, some of the ones that um, Wagamese lists, smudging, for example, the pipe ceremony, a sweat lodge. And I was always welcomed in as an outsider. Um, people knew I was a Christian minister. They, that didn't make any difference. They just invited me along. And I love what Wagami says about communion or any ritual as invitations to, our align, to align our energy with earth energy, with the creator. And this is what we missed all those hundreds of years ago. Instead of recognizing the power of another person's ritual, of their spirituality, we we trampled it. And uh, it was to their great cost and ours too. And so finally, finally, with our orange shirts and our national days and and our slow awakening, uh, we're getting ready to to recognize what what our ancestors did, settler ancestors did, and to 
try somehow to do different, to allow, as he says, to allow spirit in, to align ourselves with each other and with that beautiful energy. And at its best, this is what communion is for, for people who take communion. How do we make it the best today for ourselves? Not oppressive or exclusive. We're going to hear some stories from Deb in a moment about uh, different kinds of experiences around the table. And uh, not all of them good. But today we're seeking to have a very good experience, to make the ritual alive and real and full of energy. Uh, back in September, when I was with you for um, communion then, I told you about the study of communion I, and the thinking I did while I was still in active ministry at Glen Rhodes United. Going back to the beginnings, to the stories about Jesus and what he said and did. He did die at the hands of the Romans. And so we're right to, to recognize the power of of that, his willingness to pay that price. But his ministry was all about dining with people across gender lines, party lines, even enemy lines. So as I said last month, I wonder would Christianity be better represented by a table than by a cross? A little late now, <laughs> we've got well, 2000 years of, of the other, but uh, we had a great discussion at coffee hour last month. I was very grateful for that. I'll come back to these um, insights later. But first, here are some stories from Reverend Deborah. One of my oldest and dearest friends is a practicing Roman Catholic. During our university years, we attended different universities and were both involved in the charismatic movement. She was in the Catholic worker movement, living in communal housing, caring for the vulnerable, active in the peace movement. I was involved in an ecumenical spiritual community focused on spiritual practice, inner transformation, community building, and strengthening the broader church. During our first summer back home from university, we led a Bible study together on the beach. It was a continuation really of a lifelong journey for us as sisters in faith. Over those years, there have been many occasions when communion has been part of our shared worship. For me, the joy and gratitude in being welcomed as a full participant on some occasion has been counterbalanced by the pain of being excluded on others. Being offered a blessing in lieu of being welcome to partake in the sacrament was profoundly hurtful to me. It smacked of being regarded as unworthy, uh, lacking understanding, unable to fully appreciate its benefits. I have felt sad and angry, hurt and outraged. And I have to say my friend has felt the same and has struggled to continue in her own tradition at times because of practices such as this. And yet she and I have stayed close and we've stayed faithful to the traditions into which we were born. Over the years, as I've served in various ministry positions, I found myself offering spiritual care to exiles who for various reasons, my Roman Catholic colleagues in ministry have been unable or unwilling to minister to. It's a strange irony that, that so often moments of painful exclusion center around communion, around sharing the mystical body of Christ. I mean, sharing meals with those considered by religious authorities of his day to be unclean or unworthy or unacceptable was part of Jesus' stock and trade, which makes us wonder why we should be putting up walls where he was so intent on taking them down. Thank you. So communion can include, or uh, as you may know too, it can exclude. Um, communion can happen in odd places too when we aren't expecting it. 
a stranger shares food with us in a train station or on a trip or something. It happens at a church meal when new people show up and are instantly gathered in. Uh, it can even happen around our own dining room table at times when we realize that uh, this is special. Dining together brings us together with each other and with the holy. Uh, you have your own stories to tell. Uh, today we're going to reflect on meals with meaning from our own lives. So take a moment, think back on a meal that you have experienced as particularly meaningful, or the sharing of food. Maybe I shouldn't say a meal, the sharing of food, because it could be much simpler than a whole meal. What was transforming or healing or eye-opening about that sharing that you remember? So there'll be a little pause as you contemplate, and then you're going to be put into breakout rooms with three other people. And then everybody got a chance to, to share. Uh, it can be so powerful. Often it brings back uh, memories of loved ones and so on. I start thinking about sharing food. So the discussion today may have felt too short. You may want to go back um, to some else in the group and say if you finish your story I'm all, no, now I'm all curious how what then would happen or if you get thinking about your own story it could be that you want to do something more with it to journal about it or um, some other kind of expression to uh, go deeper into what you started to say this morning I'm thinking too about um, much much older thoughts from Isaiah for example uh, a long, you know, 2,700 years ago, a long, long time, with this vision of the rose garden God has planted, so to speak, the original vision, and then telling people, you've become a, a weed patch. Ouch. <laughs> this must have gone over <clears throat> poorly when Isaiah came, over, came out with this. God has gone to a lot of trouble to plant a vineyard. And after all these generations gets what? Not good grapes, wild grapes, no good for wine. Not justice, but bloodshed. Not righteousness, but cries of pain. And no doubt there were serious abuses in those days. But these days, Canadians are getting the same kind of mirror to look in. How is our garden of Canada, our, our vineyard, how is our vineyard doing, would we say? How would we hold up uh, in light of um, those powerful words from Isaiah? We know our history better and better. Not justice between Indigenous people and settlers. Not right relations, but bloodshed and cries. Just, just like in Bible times. So back to communion in light of the history that we're regaining and from which we're recovering. What was Jesus imagining that night when he took up some leftover bread after the Passover? It seems to me he was after what Richard Wagamese describes, people aligning their energy with earth energy, with universal energy, with eternal energy. And his vision we know now, was scary to Rome. It wasn't the way of domination, thank you very much, Caesar, but cooperation, not ruled by fear, but the rule of love. And on and on, these uh, sharp contrasts with what people were putting up with around him. Do we see communion as political? Could we? Should we? It is a powerful symbol of acceptance, God's grace, as Deb's story reminds us. But it's also a, a symbol calling us to truth and reconciliation, to human rights for all humans, the end of slavery, liberation. But you've already heard last month where I'm coming from. Deb, what is something people could be thinking of as they go to break bread in a few minutes and drink from the cup? 
I've always loved the description of sacrament as an outward and visible sign of an inward and invisible grace. When we lift the bread and bless and break it, we remember Jesus, the way he lived, the stories he told, his loving kindness and his faithfulness, his willingness to break down barriers and to go wherever the spirit led him, regardless of the consequences and cost to himself personally. In communion, we are invited to remember Jesus in more than an intellectual way. We are remembered in a visceral way. We actually eat the bread. And at the same time, it is a mystical bread. It is physical. We become the reconstituted body of Christ in and for the world through Christ. When we pour the wine and lift it in thanksgiving, we remember the lengths to which love will go. We remember Jesus' life poured out in his life and teachings as well as in his death and resurrection. We remember arms stretched out wide in forgiveness and in grace. We remember new life rising from death. We remember spirit breathed on disciples and maybe, maybe as we drink, we experience that same animating life forth flowing through us, poured out through our lives, through our stories, and bringing blessing to God's beloved world. In communion, the spiritual and the material come together in a mystical way so that we might be blessed and nourished and strengthened in love to go out into the world, to live as God's people, to be the heart and the hands and the feet of Christ, carrying on the work of spirit, love, justice, compassion, liberation, wherever we find ourselves and in whatever we do. The spiritual and the material. Perhaps we can hold both kinds of ideas, the spiritual and the political at once as we commune in a moment, or should I say all three ideas, the aligning of our energy to use Wagami's expression, and then grace and liberation, the deeply personal and the deeply political, very material, very spiritual, very connected with the earth. Uh, maybe that's too hard. Uh, then holding on to two ideas, or even one of those understandings, is, is enough. This will make our sharing of bread and the cup a sacred thing, a sacrament, a reconciling meal, good news for us and for the whole world. As we enter into this time of sharing and communion, I invite you to have your bread and juice readied. When the time comes as I lift and bless and break the bread, you are invited to do the same. And as Robin lifts and blesses the wine, again, you are invited to do the same. If you are watching with others, I invite you to feel free to serve one another. Portions of the great Thanksgiving prayer describing the bread-making God are by Reverend Bev Brazier. She wrote this when serving the United Church in Whitehorse, and we are using these with permission. So let us begin. Now is the time of the feast. Call in all the peoples the oppressed, the hungry, the tired, all who need our company and the solid solidarity of God. Our God is generous. The cup is full to overflowing. The bread is shared with all and the dance of life comes after. Thanks be to God. God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. 
We lift them up in love. Let us give thanks to Creator God. It is right to offer thanks and praise. Blessed are you, gracious God. You are a holy source of our being, always and everywhere known and unknown, treasure beyond price. You made the world and everything in it. You gave life and breath to all things. Into the stuff of the earth, you poured out your gift of life, measured it out with a lavish and generous hand, ingredients spilled everywhere, colorful and complex. You mixed and kneaded, coaxed it to rise and sang to it while it baked. You inhaled the sweet scent of creation, freshly baked and fragrant. You said, it is good. Blessed are you, gracious God. Down through the ages, you have been with us, known and unknown. After the flood, you placed a rainbow in the sky, a covenant for all life and forever. In exodus and exile, you walked with your people, freed us from slavery, and made covenant after gracious covenant to bring us knowledge and faith. Blessed are you, gracious God, but we have turned from you. We have forgotten the rainbow sign, your covenant with all living things. We have drawn lines and erected walls, caged the grace and freedom that longed to fly, fly free. We have labeled, shunned, enslaved, and hurt. In the face of hunger, we have too often withheld our meager loaves and fishes, hoarded them when you could have blessed and used them. When turning shoulders hunched against the need of the world, we have found the food moldy and rotting in our sad little satchels, as manna in its many forms has done since time began. Still in your wisdom, you gave us poets and prophets and preachers to call us back to you. Their words, a pillar of fire, a cloud in our wilderness. Their voices, a refining fire to bake for yourselves once again fresh and faithful people. You call us to renewal and repentance, to justice and compassion, to healing and wholeness. You call us to a radical vision of freedom, all life as your precious family. Blessed are you, gracious God. We thank you for sending us Jesus, bread of life and true vine, your covenant in human flesh, he lived and loved this human life, his energy aligned with earth energy and eternal energy, and prayed that we might be one. He turned water into wine. He fed multitudes with simple bread and fish. He reached out to the hurting victims of the world's brokenness and challenged those who feasted on injustice. He shared table fellowship with those whom the world had forgotten. He broke bread with the lowest and the least. He was bread for those who needed it most, and wine to gladden every heart. By his loving and living, he revealed to us truth, and among us still the leaven of his words and wisdom brings forth unexpected rising. He has blessed his people with myriad gifts and called forth from us a joyful response. So it is that we join the song of all creation. Holy, holy, holy. Oh, holy, holy, holy God, oh God of time and space, all earth and sea and sky above, every chance to your On the last night he spent with his friends, Jesus took an age-old tradition of his people and transformed it into something new. He took bread, staple food of his land, and he blessed it and broke it and gave it to those around him saying, take, 
eat this broken bread, nourishment for body and soul, a sign of abundance for all the world. Whenever you do this, remember me. And after supper, he took a cup of wine, common drink of his people, and gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. Love poured out for you, a sign of life for all the world. Each time you do this, remember me. By remembering Jesus in this way now, we claim our common heritage as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Holy God, we offer to you what we have and who we are. Bless our offerings this day whether given through PAR or e-transfer or check, offered in support of the life and ministry of this church, both here and far beyond our little corner of the world. And bless these ordinary elements of bread and juice. Transform them into sacred gifts so that the way of justice and right relationship may become a reality in our lives and in your blessed and broken world. In the name of risen love, we pray. Amen. We come to prayers of intercession, lifting up concerns in our hearts and in our world. Each time I say, Holy One, you are invited to respond. We know you hear our prayer. We know you hear our prayer. Let us pray. Creator and Savior, we praise you for all our different communities who together confess through word and deed their faith in the risen Christ. Today, especially, we pray for St. Paul's Church in Midland, for Cummer Avenue and Humbervale churches. May we become more united both in our thanksgiving for creation and in our concerted action to uphold life. Holy One. We know you hear our prayer. God, you make yourself known to us in the stories of our scriptures and in the stories of our lives. Thank you for grace, for the vision of right relations, for sending Jesus to reveal again your daring love for us and for all humankind. May love and justice come to the peoples of Costa Rica, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Panama, to survivors of colonialism and beneficiaries of colonialism. Holy One, we know you hear our prayer. God, we are grateful that you never abandon us. Grant that survivors of residential schools and other abuses may know your deep peace. Grant that we may know Christ's presence. Warm our hearts and open our understanding that we may faithfully bear witness to you. Holy One, we know you hear our prayer. God, from generation to generation, you have raised up those who would transmit their faith in the living Christ. May we be faithful to the faith with which we have been entrusted and creative in our living it out, so that together we may live with respect in creation, open up new paths for the work of your spirit in our world. Holy One. We know you hear our prayer. God of compassion, fill us and those who work in hospitals and other caring agencies with peace, strength, and empathy, that they and we may stand more effectively alongside people through all the joys and sorrows of life and death on this earth. Holy One. We know you hear our prayer. We also remember all those known to us in need of healing and peace. E.J. Brooker. Roy Dixon. Michelle Gillette. Mavis Grange and her daughter. Dorothy Grant, Joan and Clyde's friends, David and Donnelly Gullison, Phyllis Harvey, Monique's mother, Iris, 
Doug's sister, Jackie, Tanya's friend, Carol, and her family, Jim and Joyce's friend, Becky Shields, Joseph and Heather Salins, Joseph Stepaniuk, Mary's brother, Basil, and her friend, Andrea. Connie's friend, Elaine Liba, and her daughter, Andrea. Angie Fix, and all those we name now in silence. God of grace, hear these our prayers, and in your love, answer. Please join us, we pray together. We pray for ourselves. Help us to follow your lead, to create and to bless, to give without counting the cost, to trust and share and to rejoice. Give us outrageous faith, God, that kind that moves mountains and makes a difference to our neighbors here and across the globe. We gather all our prayers together into the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who meant earth and heaven with a mother's passion, Holy and blessed be your name. May your will be done through us. Give us this day the strength and humility needed for action. Forgive us our insensitivity and help us ask to be forgiven. Save us from the detours and despair and lead us not into the temptation of privilege. For your glory is human community, alive with equity and truth, now and forever. Amen. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Jesus said, I am the true vine. Whoever comes to me will never be thirsty. Come. The table is ready. Love whispers an invitation. This is the table of Jesus Christ. You are welcome here. You're invited now to eat and drink as we share in this sacred meal together.
joins us here. He breaks the bread. The one who pours the help is risen from the dead. The one we love the most is now our gracious host. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. We are now a family of which Christ is the Life-giving God, source of love, may we who share this loaf, Christ's love, live a risen life. We who drink this cup, bring new life to others. We whom the Spirit lights, give light to the world, that we and all your children shall be free and all creation will live to praise you. Amen. Amen. We are honored to have guest minister, Reverend Deborah Schneider, and her guest, Reverend Dr. Robin Wardlow, with us today. Thank you once again. We are grateful for your ministry and leadership in the service of Worldwide Communion and for the uplifting message you brought to us today. Thanks to the online team of Doug and Sean with recorded hymns by Murphy and the Choir. We are also grateful for the postlude that Murphy will present to us after the service. All the uh, news are in the e-news, so I will only highlight a few this morning. Grandmothers to Grandmothers gift card, October the 3rd to the 10th is a time to place your order by email to Bala for merchandise gift cards in support of the Stephen Lewis Foundation. Your gift cards will be ready during the third week of the month and you will be notified by email. On Wednesday, the good food box pickup is between 12.30 and 1.30 at the church and the lending library is open during office hours. Go in, Take a look at the selection of books the next time you're at the church. And there's a message from the search team. Your search team has been working very hard to find ministerial personnel for two positions. After we completed the necessary documents and received approval from the Ebenezer Board and Shining Waters Regional Council, we posted the documents on Church Hub which is a central depository for information for the United Church of Canada. The decision was made to first look for a person interested in providing short-term supply for six to nine months with the possibility of extending. This gives the team a little more time to find the right fit to lead the ministry we all share. Our task of locating the part-time pulpit supply person is progressing. We have had some resumes. We have completed some interviews. And we hope to have a decision in the near future. Then we will move on to the more permanent position selection. Unfortunately, when dealing with personal issues, we cannot share a lot of the work and decisions. But trust us as we try our best to find the right fit for a short-term supply to carry us forward for the next few months. So be patient. Please join us next week as we celebrate Thanksgiving Sunday service at 10 o'clock via Zoom with Joan Chinnery. And the worship leader will be Clyde Harris. Thank you. Thank you for inviting 
me and by extension, Robin, uh, into leadership this morning. I know Robin and I are both delighted to be here with you and hope, hope that this service has been an experience of blessing for you. And so as we leave, we offer this blessing, words of blessings of and sending forth to you. Amazing God, you come into our ordinary lives and set a holy table before us, filling our plates with the bread of life and our cups with the joy of your salvation. Send us out, O oh God, with tenderheartedness to touch an ordinary everyday world with the promise of your holiness, your yearning for right relations, and your gift of peace. Amen. Thank you.